My name is Emil Björnsson and I'm a professor of wireless communications. In this video I will share my experience as a research influencer here on YouTube and on social media. So as a professor, I'm of course doing things like writing scientific papers, I'm teaching and producing teaching material, but I've also been spending a lot of time on social media like this YouTube channel in order to share my knowledge in a different way. And why do I do that and what is the purpose of it? Well, these are some of the things I will be explaining in this video. Social media has changed how we communicate with other people in very fundamental ways. So traditionally, the communication has been one dimensional. So we have had news broadcasting, for example, from a news channel to receivers who can't communicate back. And in a similar way, when we are sharing information as researchers, we might write a paper and we publish it in a journal and people look in the journal and read the information, but there is no simple way for them to communicate back to us as researchers. But social media is changing this by creating this way of instantly interacting with each other on the internet. And I have been spending quite some time thinking about how this might change the research community. And this all started more than 10 years ago. I think that an important trend to consider is the explosion of scientific content. So here you can see the number of new publications per year over the years. And it was rather constant for a while. And then starting in the 1960s, it started to grow very rapidly. And now we see this kind of exponential growth. And even if the amount of new scientific content is growing, one can ask the question, is the information content really important, useful discoveries growing at the same pace? And I think the answer is no. We are training more and more researchers, but we are not doing more and more breakthroughs. And this is then leading to a ocean of content where we can have some important pieces here and there, but it's really hard to find them. And that is why curation of content becomes really important. To be this kind of lighthouse in an ocean of content that can direct readers to the important pieces to read. And I think that the research influencer can be that lighthouse that identifies the important content and help other people to stay up to date by sharing it through their channels on social media. Another important thing that the social media is creating is the possibility of curating yourself, which is also known as the age of profilicity. So in the past, people could say things like, you should be yourself, that's the only thing you can be. But today, with social media, you can view yourself in the eyes of others and curate how other people are perceiving you. There's, for example, the book You and Your Profile, which has this quote. We present ourselves and encounter others through profiles. A profile shows us not as we are seen directly, but how we are perceived by the broader public. As we observe how others observe us, we calibrate our self-presentation accordingly. You might have heard about this as this LinkedIn effect, where people have a certain state in reality, and they create a LinkedIn alter ego that is describing themselves in bigger words, such that Jane used ChatGPT a few times, and then she describes herself as an AI and value list, an expert who knows ChatGPT and Bard and every other AI tool. And you can create many more examples of this when people are taking the real life persona and describe it with a little bit of exaggerating words. And you might look down on that, but I really think this is just what we call a genuine pretender, where you're not faking anything, you're just striving for elevating yourself by describing yourself in a positive manner. And this is, for example, how I look like at social media, in LinkedIn in this case. I'm an Archipoli fellow, a professor, and I have this wireless future channel on YouTube. And what role do I strive for in the research community by creating this persona? I have a number of different target groups that I'm trying to reach out to through my social media activities. And in general, target groups can be things like your friends and family, could be your colleagues, could be the larger sector like industry, academia, where you're active. It could be the national public or the international public. And different materials fits different target groups. 
My target audience is typically the wireless research community or engineers working in the wireless communication industry, but it could also be students who are trying to learn things in this area. To some extent, I'm also creating popular science content on the Wireless Future channel in order to address the general public, but I'm not reaching out as well with that kind of content. I'm also using things like Instagram for personal content addressing friends and family, but that is a very different audience. It all started for me on our research gate, where people are discussing uh, research problems, sharing papers and so on. And I noticed that there were a message board there where people could ask questions. And I thought that I, with my expertise, I had recently taken a PhD at that time, could answer questions of kind of basic things from within my area and share that knowledge free of charge to other people, typically students from developing countries that were trying to learn these topics without having access to the best teachers or the best books in the world. I also thought that I should share my simulation code and GitHub is a community for that uh, where you can share code for your research papers and help others to build on your result and do better research in the long run. And from there, I have evolved into having essentially five different pillars of social media activities. The first two are still ResearchGate and GitHub, but I'm nowadays spending even more time on other platforms. One of them is, of course, YouTube, where you are right now. Another one is LinkedIn, where, that I'm using to share information about what I'm doing on other platforms. And then I have the blog Wireless Future as well. So let's take a closer look at these different platforms. Starting with the blog, Wireless Future, it was once called the Massive Mimo blog, and here I am writing about a number of different things. Content that is not fitting in a normal kind of publication in the scientific way on the peer review or these type of things, but I can speak more freely and express my views on things. There are basically four types of posts on this blog. One of them is that I try to explain a concept that I think is often misunderstood. One example is what is beamforming and different terminologies around that. Another thing is some comment on telecom news that I'm picking up and try to put into a context, connect what is actually happening in development of products compared to what has been happening in the research community. Another example is to summarize a line of research that we have conducted in my group over a substantial amount of time. We can summarize the main insights and what papers to read to get the details regarding them. And finally, I might link to content that is shared on other platforms, such as YouTube. This is a blog that I shared together with my colleague, Professor Eric G. Larson from Linship University, and we started it in September 2016. The traffic, in terms of the number of visitors per day, have been growing over the years, and you can see also when we are publishing new blog posts, we also have momentarily larger traffic. But on the average, over a week, we have some 5,000 visitors and 20,000 views. Here is a visitor map from October 2024. And you can see that people are accessing from almost all countries in the world. The top visiting countries is the US, China and India. The same year, 2016, we also created the video version, this YouTube channel. And on this channel, Wireless Future, as it's called today, we are publishing typically six different types of videos. The first one are keynotes or invited talks. Often I have been invited to give talks at a number of different workshops or conferences, and I give different version of the same talks a few times, and then when I feel that I want to start talking about something else, I'm recording a version of it for YouTube instead of throwing away the slides and forget about them. Other conference presentations of technical papers is something we're publishing occasionally. And there is the frequently asked question videos, which is sort of a version in video format of this content that I'm writing about concepts on the blog. There is lecture and overview videos for courses that we have at our universities, popular science videos, and finally podcast videos between me and Eric Larson. Over the years, I've been experimenting with different ways of recording YouTube videos. I started with recording myself in front of a projector screen, and this is kind of simple. You're just standing and presenting as you would normally do in a room. The problem is that it's hard to get a good lighting condition both on the screen and on yourself at the same time. 
Then I tried out to standing in front of a TV screen instead, so you can have some better light conditions on yourself while still presenting in a kind of natural way in front of a screen. After that I started to use a green screen and capture what is happening on my screen, so just presenting in PowerPoint for example, record what is on the screen, record myself with a camera and then paste these two things together into just one video where I'm visible at the same time as the slides. And finally, one can create with the green screen something where you're not actually seeing anything on the screen, you, afterwards you're creating animations in a video editing program and put the whole things together after that, which is requiring way much more time. So I would say in general that recording in front of a TV screen is actually what gives you high quality videos without having to spend a lot of effort on post-processing. You can just record everything and then cut it a little bit afterwards and do some retakes if you are not satisfied with something that you are saying. This is how the room looks like where I'm at right now. I'm sitting on this chair and behind me I have a green screen, I have a microphone next to me, I have a computer where I'm sharing the slides and recording what is on the screen. Here I'm putting a tripod with for example a mobile phone recording myself and then I have some light panels here that lights up from two different directions so I should get a good video quality on my face. So typically I might be showing some slides, I might record myself in front of it and then I paste it all together into one video. And This is really simple if you have a video editing program such as Final Cut Pro where you can just take this as two different layers, put them on top of each other and make sure that they are aligned in terms of the audio and then you just have to cut the beginning and the end and you're done. So the editing is very little. Let's now dissect the YouTube traffic from 2016 to 2022. After that we had some time when the YouTube algorithms were showing our videos to a lot of people who didn't want to watch them. So that's why we had some spikes. I will not show you that traffic. So in 2022 we had some 18 1,500 subscribers and already more than a million views on YouTube. And the traffic was very little in the beginning. Then I published a video called How will 5G technology handle 1,000 times more data? It appeared in early 2018 and after that the traffic has been growing steadily. One thing you can notice over here in early 2020 was that the pandemic started and the traffic was doubling over the night more or less. And after that we have had substantially more traffic and also an increased number of videos because particularly during the pandemic I was recording a lot of content for my general teaching and put them on YouTube in addition to showing them to my own students. Since 2022 the traffic has been growing substantially and we now have 50% more subscribers. Both on the blog and on YouTube there is a possibility of interacting with me. So we have a lot of questions being asked all the time and I'm spending some time when I'm at the bus stop or waiting for the train to try to answer these questions and interact with the audience. One of the new things you can do as a research influencer as compared to just publishing papers and waiting for someone else to write another paper to react on it or meeting people personally on conferences. So this is something that I've been spending a lot of time. There are thousands of comments and questions being asked or answered over the lifetime of the blog and YouTube channel. When the COVID-19 pandemic started to close down society, we already were quite active on social media with the blog and the YouTube channel. And my colleague Eric Larsen suggested that we should take the next step, namely to start a podcast. And that happened in October 2020 and since then we have recorded more than 40 episodes where Eric and I are discussing what is happening in the wireless community. News, research results, some of them being our own insights from our research or we have read papers or been to conferences and want to summarize what is going on. The target audience is the same as for our other activities, namely students, colleagues and people working in the telecom industry. And we started recording this as a video podcast where we are speaking to each other, but there is nothing specifically in the video that requires you to watch them. You can just as well listen. This was on purpose because we wanted to piggyback on the fact that we have a YouTube channel where people could find us, but we also wanted to convert people into listening to this podcast while commuting to work or taking a walk and so on. So influencers are people who have acquired or developed their fame and notability through the internet. And there's a number of different categories of influencers. 
There is the agitators who try to stir the pot and create healthy debate. There are journalists that create the new news industry by interacting directly with their audience. There are the traditional celebrities that are reaching millions of people. There are people who build their own personal brand and create some kind of fame for themselves and their name then become equity that can be utilized to sell products. There are analysts that form and communicate credible insights to people. There are activists who try to spread their beliefs to other people. There are experts who write the textbooks and this is where I belong to, I think. And there are the authority whose opinion is worth more than gold in their specific space. And this might be where I'm striving for becoming in the long term. People in all these categories can have different reach. And we typically talk about four different tiers. The nano influencers with less than 10,000 followers, the micro between 10 and 50,000, the macro between 50,000 and a million, and the mega influencers with more than 1 million followers. And I belong myself then to the micro category, which is a micro influencer is a person famous within a niche group of users on social media platform. And I think that is right interpretation. I'm known in the wireless communication community for the content that I'm producing for that community. So what are the purposes of being an influencer? Well, the thing that a lot of people are talking about is influencer marketing, how companies are providing advertisement to influencers in order to reach their followers with their products. Another part of it is the self-branding that you're creating some kind of fame within a particular community. So with that in mind, why am I doing all of these things I've been describing in this video? Well, I'm not making any specific money out of this YouTube channel. There is even no advertisement, as you might have noticed. I want to curate research and knowledge and spread what I think is the important result to the research community in wireless communications. In particular, I try to reach out with the knowledge that I've developed through my own research and promote the scientific discussion in those areas by creating this platform where you can discuss this with me or with other people. Because all of these discussions for at the blog or on the YouTube channel is open for anyone to be part of the discussion. I try to become a thought leader in this area by sharing my view on different topics. I try to promote research reproducibility by being a role model in terms of sharing code to a lot of my papers and books on GitHub. I like to support my own research group by sharing the results that we have produced together because it's always a team effort and I hope that that can help their careers as well because other people are getting more aware of the result that they have been producing. And finally, I think that it's really exciting to be an early adopter and explore what influencership could actually mean in the research community. Are you a researcher and would like to become a research influencer? Well, then I have some final pieces of advice for you. The first thing is to have a goal for your activity so you can plan what you're doing. And it's important to know that it takes time to build up an audience. You could see that in the traffic on my platforms as well. It took years before it really took off. And that's why it's important to have a goal and a strategy towards that goal and keep doing good things and evolve. And as you could see, produce videos that looks more and more beautiful over time. It is also important to identify your target audience so that you know who you're producing content for and can make sure that those people will be interested in most of the content so they have a reason to become a subscriber. You should find the right ambition level so you can keep doing this for a long period of time and not give up because you feel that, oh, I'm spending way too much time on this. And maybe you can connect this to activities that you're having yourself, such as recording talks that you're anyway preparing for conferences or other situations when you will be presenting things in your teaching. And finally, you benefit in the long run by being generous with the content that you're providing. Don't expect that you will get a lot of extra citations or that people will start talking about you immediately. But in the long term, you can steer the trajectory of other people's research and help them learn topics. And that will benefit you in the long run because other people will be interested in the research that you are doing and start conducting research in those areas as well. 
So I hope I have inspired you to become a research influencer or even just wanting to become a researcher in this new era where we are using social media in addition to traditional things in order to reach out with the content that we are doing. If you are not already a subscriber, please subscribe to watch all the other content that I'm providing on this YouTube channel.